Again, page 109 for those that are following along. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me, and the light around me turn to night. Darkness is not dark to you, O Lord. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, kindle within us the fire of love, that by its cleansing flame we may be purged of all our sins and made worthy to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lumen ad revelationem gentium et gloriam plebis tue Israel. Lumen ad revelationem gentium et gloriam plebis tue Israel. Lumen ad revelationem gentium et gloriam plebis tue Israel. O gracious light, your brightness of the ever-living Father in heaven, O Jesus Christ, holy and blessed, now as we come to the setting of the sun and our eyes behold the vesper light, we sing your praises, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy at all times to be praised by happy voices. O Son of God, O giver of life, and to be glorified through all the worlds. Amen. Well, again, God's peace and welcome to everyone. <coughs> As Brother Addison serves our tea on this end, I'll catch everyone up on what, uh, where we left off last week. Last week we finished with the Council of Ephesus and Chalcedon, which went through our Christological controversies. Just like the pattern of the Trinitarian councils, Nicaea and Constantinople, that we discussed the way, the or two weeks prior to that, the pattern was first you had to establish that it was a single entity, and then as that pendulum went too far to that side, we had to establish that they were still distinct. So Nicaea made sure to combat the Arians and say that yes, God is one as opposed to the hierarchy that Arius was trying to get across. Constantinople came back and said, well, while they are in fact one God, they are still three in the Trinity. And they had to make sure that each was distinct. And that's where we get the addition of the Holy Spirit uh, in the latter half of our Nicene, which is our Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. The same pattern held true for our Christology. We had the Eutychian, no, first, excuse me, the Nestorian heresy, and to combat that, they had to emphasize the unity, the two natures of Christ, as one, one Christ. Where we got, where we get it from Cyril, the Miaphysite term, that one nature. Well, as that pendulum swung too far in that direction, the council was then called in Chalcedon, so that we had a firm definition of both natures, that he was fully human and fully divine. Again, this ostracized others, and that's the pattern that we see. Every single time that we call out something as orthodox, you have to define what is not orthodox as heresy, and they get pushed to this outskirts. With the Chalcedonian uh, decision, 
that was when we have one of the largest breakaways, the largest schisms, with the Oriental Orthodox Church, part of which you would most recognize as the Ethiopian and the Coptic Orthodox Churches. These Orthodox, the Oriental Orthodox Churches, these still hold to the Monophysite, Miaphysite understanding of the nature of Christ, and it's only recently as we've seen in the news with the conversations between the Coptic churches and the Anglican Communion, that we're able to come back into dialogue recognizing that what divided the church in the fifth century was an emphasis on one nature over another, not the exclusion of those two natures. It all comes down to language. Are we talking about nature? Are we talking about person? Is it hypostasis? Is it homoousia, homoousio? All it comes down to is language. And a lot of the, the breakthroughs that we've seen in just the past few years between the dialogues of these two communions have been a recognition of the limits of language. What we're going to discuss today is not a limit of language, it is a limit of theology, or at least a difference in fundamental theology and cosmic order. The controversy, the heresy that we'll name today comes from the prophet Manny, M-A-N-E or M-A-N-I, depending on its transliteration. He was a Syrian or Persian uh, prophet in the early 3rd century, I think he was born around 217. <laughs> and the prophet Manny, he was writing in Persian, and he wasn't necessarily Christian. The, the philosophy that he created was one of a cosmic order between good and evil. That you have a fundamental quality in the universe that is good. This entity, this force, this desire and drive, that is what is good. On the other side, you have a distinct and opposing entity, which is evil. And this evil force is always at odds with the good force, and that's the battle of the universe, the battle of creation. And you have what feeds into a more dualistic system that we would recognize in Platonism and some of Gnosticism between the spirit world and the material world. And that's where we begin to see a Manichaeist uh, influence in Christianity. Now, while Manny was a prophet in the third century, an entirely Persian, minding his own business up there, we have a notable Christian, or one who would become a Christian, who gives to us so much of our baggage in our Christian history. And this is the great and laudable and verbose St. Augustine of Hippo. St. Augustine, really starting his theology in the end of the 4th century, going into the 5th century, so late 300s, going into the 400s. St. Augustine, as before he converted fully to Christianity, he was a Manichaeist. He was a Manichaeist believing in this divine battle between the natures of good and the natures of evil. He converted fully to Christianity in 387. This probably coincides with another edict coming from Emperor Theodosius. You may remember him from last week. He was the, or two weeks ago, he was the one that made Christianity the law of the land with the Edict of Thessalonica. He was the one that called the Council of Constantinople, which helped define the Nicene theology that we developed in 325. He also gave an edict that said all Manichaean monks, so we begin to see Manichaeism coming into Christianity, he said all you Manichaean monks are going to get kicked out. So being the good political, politically astute monk that he was, uh, St. Augustine converts fully to Christianity and theoretically abandons his Manichaean tendencies. It's often said of St. Augustine, often criticized of him, that he is nothing but a Christian, uh, or rather he is a Neoplatonist in a Christian garb. This Neoplatonism, this strict duality, there are a lot of scholars that criticize that, saying that his duality doesn't actually come from Platonism, or Neoplatonism even. 
though you have some that are reclaiming Augustine's Platonism, not as seen through Calvin, but as seen for what Platonism actually was. And there's some good work on redeeming that Platonism of Augustine. But the severe duality, I would argue, doesn't actually so much come from his Platonist tendencies, because he did love Plotinus, and that's where he got his Neoplatonism. But that strict duality is far more indicative of Manichaean theology. That there is good and there is evil. They are two opposing forces, and one has to fight for the other to win out. The way he split it is that the physical body, again, gets in the way of the spirit. That this physical body is corrupt in its fall from grace, and therefore it is a temptation that must be suppressed. Unfortunately, some of that temptation of the flesh becomes uh, derisive of women. And that's what we've inherited so much of, especially through Calvin, and then from Calvin through Knox. We see a lot of this in the Reformed tradition. But this duality that we see forces us into corners. Now, Manichaeism was deemed a heresy. It was thrown out. He says you can't have this duality, a good versus an evil. But we're still left with the fundamental question of what is the nature of good and evil and the relationship between the two. <coughs> and that's what I want us to discuss most tonight. And this is where we'll open it up to conversation. But let me frame the questioning right now. You have two ways of looking at good and evil. You can either have the Manichaean form, where there is an entity that is good in the universe. You have an entity that is bad or evil, and the two are at war. The language of Christianity makes this easy. You have God and you have Satan. And we see so much of that language, this divine warfare that God is constantly at battle with Satan because Satan is the father of evil. He is the entity, the force of corruption. His sole purpose is to be a dividing force against God. You have God on one side that produces good, and then you have evil, which is Satan, on the other. That means that in the cosmic order, if good is to win, then the devil must be defeated. That you must have that final battle. You must have that ultimate uh, destruction of Satan, that final slaying of the demon in order for good to win out. That's how you have salvation. If salvation is good over evil, then evil must be destroyed. The alternative rather than having good as a separate entity from evil, is to say that good is what is by nature God, what God intends. Evil is not an opposing force of good, but it is an, it is a, an existence, or a state, if you will, where good is not being allowed to shine through. A similar situation or analogy would be light. Light and darkness. Darkness is not a physical thing that creeps into the room and then jumps on the candle and snuffs it out. Darkness is simply when the light is being overshadowed, when the light is being held back and blocked such that darkness can exist. Evil, therefore, in this analogy, is when good is being restrained, when something is stopping us from being good. From that, I want you to consider this. We'll open it up to discussion, and then I'll come back in and try to reframe it to see where we go with it. Think now of another person who you might think of as evil, someone who is the embodiment, the most evil person you can think of, uh, whether it is Adolf Hitler, Saddam Hussein, your co-worker at work, whoever you think is that evil person, I want you to have them in mind. And now you have, if you're supposed to be the good one, now that's taking a lot of pride on ourselves, but the sake of argument, let's imagine we're on the good side. If we're the good and we're facing evil in our life, that person that is evil, what has to happen 
for good to overcome. I want you to consider that scenario and consider it in both instances, both a Manichaean duality where it is good versus evil, and then from a more orthodox standpoint where good is simply, or evil rather, is the absence of good. If that person is evil, how will you approach them and deal with them in either situation? So now take a moment to consider, and as you're ready, simply unmute, and let's hear what your thoughts are, and then I'll bring us back on. So if you have any thoughts, go ahead and join us now. You all have any other thoughts or thinking? I would tie it back to what you said last week in terms of sin. Be sure to speak up so we can hear on Be sure to speak up so we can hear on the mic. I'm speaking as up as I can. Okay. Um, the concept of sin being out of relationship with God and out of relationship with others. Uh -huh. So that being out of relationship would be the disconnect that doesn't let the light through. There you go. So what Brother Francis offers is that if we look at sin like we did last week, and to recap from last week, uh, we talked about sin two ways. There's either the idea that sin is what you do, or there is this sin of why you do it. If sin is a checklist, whether it's a list of commandments or a list of rules scattered between Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and everything else, if it's a checklist that if I do this, this action by definition is sin, then whether or not you do it, whether or not your intent is right behind it, what you do is the sin. The other option, however, is to see that why you do it, the intent behind it, is the sin. But you can do the same action, but how you relate to the person with whom you are sinning, or against whom, rather, you are sinning, that is significant because it's the relationship. To sin is not to do a thing. To sin is to be out of relationship with God. So if your intent breaks the relationship, then that is sin, not necessarily the actual action. So as Brother, so Brother Francis, uh, with that reframed, how did you say again that if we look at good and evil, how does that relate to then if sin is being out of relationship with God or with your neighbor or even with yourself, then that is the darkness that gets in the way of the light shining through. Is the break in the relationship causes the blockage in the light. And therefore, good is when you're not blocking, when you're in relationship, when things are going well. And evil is the being out of relationship with people, with God, with yourself. Um, the, the phrase that popped up in mind is probably not appropriate exactly to that analogy, but I remember someone saying to me in a discussion about Hitler, but he loved his dogs and he loved children. But he was clearly out of relationship um, with a whole bunch of other people, mm -hmm. which would put him out of relationship <laughs> with God. Yeah. Houston, do you have anyone that wants to join in the conversation? Well, I I kind of feel that the both the theory both have theory. Validity, validity, and the truth of the Because I do believe in the belief of the physically palatable entity that is Satan, that is Satan, that is in opposition to God, but I also believe that, again, sin is break that break in the relationship with God. Uh, so I, I don't think either theory is a complete theory. I think the truth I think the truth is on the point. So let me uh, prefer a question then, since you've got both sides. For for there to be an entity that is evil and against God, let's say that's whether a person 
or uh, Satan himself. To have an entity that is against and opposed to God, can there be anything outside of God? No, they're very mysterious. What do you mean outside of God? So the to be clear with the Manichaeist view is that you would have good on this side, and you would have a separate entity that is evil, equal in opposition to the good. So the the and it's a constant battle to see who's going to win out in that. Uh, so if you have Satan versus, let's say, uh, God, then the Manichaean side would go so far as to say that Satan is equal in power to God. And it's just a matter of seeing who's going to win out for the universe at the end of days. That, and that was really the danger of Manichaeism, is that you created an entity that was equally powerful against God. So when I ask, is there something that can be outside of God, uh, when we cast the devil as evil, or Satan as evil, the question is this, is he something that is outside of God's authority? Is he now something apart from and out from under God's authority that God has to be uh, worried about and therefore constantly in battle with? Is that no. how you're seeing? No. Okay. No, 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 no. So clarify, clarify your side for me. No, I think what, what John was saying, and I, I totally agree with him, it's, it's not either or. Um, okay. I think, um, yes, there is. there are evil entities. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's God, absolutely. Yeah. But it's, it's in the Bible, right? Exactly. Um, they were created by God, and they just kind of fell away. But um, it's, it's also not that if you are not perfect and constantly thinking about God, that you're not sinful, or that you're sinful, right? Because that, because that means that the two choices that you that you pose right. are to a dream. and I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. And if you want yeah. to use the concept of that, you could also apply that at the micro level to the individual, where we also have good inside. Uh, you can look at it in a actually a good entity and a bad entity. And I think we also carry that duality that where we're not always perfect. Um, I am. <laughs> I was going to say that's what happened. Of course you are, yes. I would have put my two cents in. Um, yeah. When Satan was kicked out of heaven. Uh -huh. Okay. And we were given the choice of either following God or following Satan. We set up we were set up. God expects us, loves us, wants us, is open to us. But if we choose to follow Satan, that too is part of God's Give to us. We don't have to choose him. He wants us to choose to be his and to follow him. And in order for us to have that choice, we have to have evil. Mm -hmm. we, have to have, we have to have evil and good in order to see both. We have to have light and dark in order to see both. They, and to make those choices as to what works for us. Okay. Those of us that love and follow God do so because we choose to see that light, like, see the good, and to want that good. That's what makes us more complete as individuals and as a collective group. We're God's children. Right. Whether you want to be or not, he creates us. We belong to him. And whether we stay there is that choice. That choice. Does that matter? That matter. Talk it out. Talk it out. He was the angel. He was. He was. And the problem with the problem with us today, in our time, is we are the very 
easily, easily physical, physical, um, temporary, temporary, shallow, shallow view of us. We have a tendency not to go beneath, go beneath the surface. And when you go beneath the surface, you see the true beauty. Mm. It's not just in the world, it's in the school. And without that, without that, you never know, never know beauty. And we will not yeah. know the beauty of God Himself. Right, and I agree with you on that. So let me, um, again, let me reframe. So you've given good points. Now I'm going to give you another testing ground. So if we look at the model of good and evil, and really this is going down to how we relate to others that we consider evil. So right now, imagine a person. And this is how the, the framework would go depending on whether or not evil is something to be overcome as a separate entity. So the way it will work, or the way the theology would work is, <clears throat> if you have good versus evil, in order for good to win, evil has to be destroyed as a separate entity. Now when we look at the great cosmic metaphysics, if we look at the, the host of angels, <clears throat> then we feel somewhat okay with that, saying that, well, Satan can be vanquished entirely. Satan has to be destroyed in order for God to win. But let us consider what that looks like as it plays out with people. And this is the far more practical theology that we need to see through this. If you look at evil as something that is opposed to good, then evil has to be overcome for good to win out. If someone is evil, and this is what we see a lot in the casting of warfare, that you have to vilify the other as something to be overcome and destroyed so that good can finally flourish. It's the premise of warfare, to justify the killing. And if good wins out because evil is destroyed, then that destruction of someone we call evil is how we justify the destruction of a person. But what if we take the orthodox side where good and evil are simply states of one or the other? That evil is the absence of good. If we take it that way, and this is more of the Jewish mystic side that we've inherited, and in, each, in each and every person, there is an aspect of good. And to say that someone is evil is not to say they are a separate entity that must be destroyed for good to win out elsewhere. But if we see it as a state of being, or almost like a, um, a scale, if you will. Continuum. Continuum, that's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> Thank you. If you're looking at a continuum then to look at someone who is quote-unquote evil, we have to recognize that there is still good in them. And for the good to come out is not to destroy the evil, but it's to let the good shine through more. So in that instance, the success of good is not the destruction of evil, it is actually the redemption of evil. This, if we then translate to a more cosmic sense, I mean, I would trust that even as human beings we can see that. We can see at least the benefit of that. That if we approach someone as someone we should redeem, not just destroy, then we recognize the God that is in them, the face of Christ, and that is what we reach out to, trying to let that shine, that, that holy spark, uh, as the Baal Shem Tov would say, that holy spark shine through. If we take it, though, to the cosmic level, we have to test ourselves with our theology. Do we really believe that God created and said it was good? And if God created everything, that means in everything, in all creation, there is good. If we keep pushing it, yeah, we have no problem with that. All right, so hold on, so if we keep pushing then, if we all admit that God created and God said it was good, that meant that everything God created, including a fallen angel, 
named right. Lucifer right. that we call Satan. Right. Even right. Satan. Right. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> I know I just started the fire and let y'all run with it. Sorry, but, you started it. <laughs> I know, I know. So that means, that means that there is nothing outside God's power that God could eventually, even if at the end of time, finally redeem. There is a Persian vision in the, the eastern side of the faith. Uh, there is this description of hell. It says, even, it says, at the end of days, even the gates of hell will be overgrown with flowers. Mm -hmm. The fundamental belief behind that is at the end of days, everything in creation can finally be redeemed because there is nothing outside of God that God cannot finally in time or eternity redeem. So with that in mind... What are your thoughts, or did that push us too far in our theology? I'm wondering. So no, let me know what you think. Who we are, actually. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 I've got a problem. Okay. Uh, I mean, and I'm trying to think of, of, of where it is where, it is, uh, where God does it. There are people that are people that reprobate mind, reprobate mind. You know, I am, I am through with them. Uh -huh. You know, you know, I, I just, if that's the case, and the Bible also, also says that at the end of time, you know, when Satan is abandoned and people are basically thrown into the lake of fire, mm -hmm. that's allegorical. Go there, but uh, doesn't that imply that there has to be some form of everlasting punishment before the everlasting good occur. Well, that's the. I mean, that's the difficulty. Or is it that there has to be some reckoning and punishment for the evil because it has chosen to be evil, exactly. and that good will overcome. That evil, because it has been chosen to those that have chosen to follow the good. I mean, I don't like to follow anybody. I don't like to follow anything separate from God. But I also have a really hard time. Really hard time. Well, at the end of the end of time, God's going to go. God's going to go. Yeah, not so much. Don't worry about it. Uh, it's just like the, the work of the work morning and the afternoon and the afternoon. Oh, it's true. It's true. You know, we don't know. We don't know in people's heart. Right. Um, um, yeah. 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 And we may have been good our whole lives. We might get the same reward as the guy that at the very last second. Well, well I'm, not talking, I'm not talking about people on the cross and the I'm talking about the answer why it's so much. Like in Osama bin Osama. Exactly. Who, who died unrepentant. Uh, uh, I, I just, I, I, just again, I find that very good. <laughs> very good. Because I do believe that God is good on but I believe my heart is also a false confession of Krishna. Um, can I throw in my two cents? Hold on, Houston. Hold on. We're gonna we're gonna offer some on this side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, go ahead, sir. Um, just the idea that um, like we, we pointed out, like Osama bin Laden died unrepentant. Um, can you speak up? Speak up. Speak up. Oh, we brought up the idea that uh, Osama bin Laden died unrepentant. Um, I, he would have died unrepentant because he didn't think he had anything to repent for. Is Osama bin Laden would have seen the West as evil. Uh, so the yeah, like I mean, no one's evil. They don't think they're evil. They think they're doing what is right. Uh, so really, evil is just we don't understand why they're doing it. So we just blame it on evil. 
because I, I guess we're not bothering to actually figure out. Yeah. Why they do what they're doing. Good point. Very good point. Brother Francis. If you go back into the Old Testament, into the Kabbalistic readings, into the Gematria, Lucifer, who actually is not named in the Old Testament, he's named in the Apocrypha, and Christ are the roles as the tempter towards breaking with God and breaking the law and the tempter towards following God and following the law. He is still the light bringer and the most beautiful even though he's cast out of heaven. And in the Bible it doesn't talk about the fallen angels being gone forever. It talks about them, they're still there, they're just not in God's counsel. But the two big stories in Job, he goes to God and says, do you have a person who's so good that they will believe in you no matter what we do with them and can I try them out? Um, and I just forgot the other story, but there's another one where Satan goes to God and says, hey, let me have a shot at this person and see if I can break their relationship with you. It's in... Actually, even later than this in Christianity, it's in the Middle Ages that this whole thing about Satan being evil and Satan being the devil and Satan being all these, you know, Satan made me do it, the devil made me do it, start being part of the Christian doctrine along with, you know, post-Augustine of Hippo, who I also have a lot of issues with. Um, so and you. all the misogyny, all the oppression of people who are not like me, the uh, xenophobias, is much, much later in Christianity. It's not in Judaism. Houston? Well, I think we... <laughs> well, again... I... <laughs> I, I I just I have I have a real problem and well, okay, I think we're a little confused about where this is going. What what are we trying to do? So what we're doing is we're wrestling with how we look at and how we approach what we call evil. Ultimately, that's what the heresy is concerned with, and the orthodoxy is concerned with. So we're really talking about the heresy. We're not talking about having this. Give uh, lots of discussion about how we think we're talking about the actual heresy. Well, ultimately, talking about the heresy needs to allow us to consider how we approach one another and other people, and what we think of our own theology. So, you know, to so are you asking me then if I am. If I view someone that I know that I have to work with as someone that's evil, you're mm -hmm. asking me what kind of relationship am I going to have with that person? Yep, that's How right. Do them? Is that what you're right. asking? Okay. Yes, I'm asking you, how does this play out? I'm on the practical side at this point. So when you go up to your neighbor next door and their dog pooed on your yard, and you realize this I'll give you, is... I'll give you a very good example. There was a little woman that lived next door. You may remember her. And we had some feral cats. Yeah. And she was a very nasty old lady, and she used to put rat poison under her house to destroy the cats. Right. And I used to have to really bite my tongue when I would be out on the front lawn because she would come out and complain about it. And I basically felt sorry for her that she viewed life that negatively at this point in her life, especially. Right. And um, I felt compassion for her. Um, um, I didn't go and try to burn her house down or anything like that, you know, but uh, I certainly, I blessed her. I blessed her, actually. Right. actually. And that's, I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, being a practical theologian and a practical contemplative, that's what we need to look at. The grander schemes of how people are dealt with in God's judgment is a back is a back burner question. I don't want you to uh, just walk away from it though because 
uh, this is a fundamental question that we still see theologians wrestling with. They have wrestled with this fundamental question, which you just hit upon, uh, and we've they've wrestled with for hundreds well, and hundreds of years. I gave myself over to animal in me, I would have liked to have gone over and burned her house down, actually. <laughs> right. for, for once and for all. But yeah. that's... You know, my Sunday school kicked in, my Sunday school training, and so I realized, you know, I should do that. That's not right. God would want me to do that. I should love her, even as difficult as that may, might be. Right. So, um, I mean, I ended up going off to Harrison and in Jersey, so that's how God remedied it for me. I prayed for her and her and her life. I guess so I have to I, I have Different person, first of all, I don't think it's my business. Right? I mean, it's, you know, you know, somebody gets funded, it's funded, it's awarded. What I'm talking about is to try and create the best that God, you know, create in that situation. In that Right. It's not. 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 It's Perfectly good reason why you know somebody went into a house in Pittsburgh last night and shot a bunch of people who were having a party in the backyard. Mm. But on the surface, you have to admit that was cool and pretty cool. Uh, and you know, they're, they're obviously again a, a, a palpable. Evil force out there in the world. Do I think that it's greater than God? No. But do I think again that they're they're passive? Again, something so justice out there, out there. Not mine to get. Not mine to get. Right. But you know, you know, out there, there has to to balance. I I just I just. I, I, I can't, I can't, there is isn't. and you know, again, I believe very deeply, deeply, you know, you know, what we, what we learned in catechism, we learned that Christ came to, Christ died to save sinners, of whom I am chief. I don't believe that I am anybody to cast the stone, however, I, I, I mean, evil is out there. So the the question is, we'll take the the shooters for instance. Um, when we frame evil, and this again goes to the practical side, if we see them as evil and something that we must avoid, and we objectify the person, I think that's the heart of it. When you objectify someone as evil. You say they are evil. It's easy to cast them off, and that's the danger. And perhaps those that are there in the room in Houston, I know here in Atlanta, um, that's not something we would do, but we can see instances so easily where if we know they're bad, then they have to be punished and put away. But we also have to remember that the same God who would punish someone is the same God who in the form of Christ said, I want you to visit those in prison, those that are, by your laws, being punished. And it's the same Christ that in our theology on Holy Saturday went down into hell during the harrowing of hell, and as the icons of our church show, broke the very doors of hell off the hinges. So even there, there's a theology that we wonder how far can Christ's redemptive work go? And this overarching question, which we won't have an answer for tonight, but one that has been heatly debated. I thought we were going to get an answer from you, brother. <laughs> I must leave you with a question, my God, a contemplative of a question. It never happened. 
But the other question that we wrestle with is this. Is our grace, is our salvation in any way cheapened if God does not punish others that have sinned? No. No. Not at all. Right. So that leaves us with the question, how necessary is our belief in punishment to believe in God? And this idea of eternal damnation for those who deserve it. I don't think I don't think we can really give much thought about how God is what God is going to do with the other person. Um, right. Right. It's more important what is God doing with a me? Mm -hmm. What is my reality with God? Even though I give them why you call someone uh, evil based on their acts toward me, um, I it's not my role to judge the other person, but that doesn't mean I'm going to um, obviously around that for that person also if they are uh, demonstrating evil acts. Right. But to channel Brother Jamie, um, who isn't here, he is the one that brought it to my attention for something like Philadelphia. We pray not only for the people who were killed and hurt and their families, but we also pray for the shooter and his family. And I know a lot of people who get very, very, very upset at that concept. Mm. Um, but as you said, we don't know why. We don't know why he might have felt they deserved it. So we pray for everybody and put them in God's hands. I agree. I agree. And that was new to me about four years ago or five years ago. I hadn't prayed against them, but I hadn't prayed for the the perpetuators. So, you know, if we hadn't prayed, if we don't pray for them, then. Why should any should pray for us? If we don't, we don't pray for the ability to give, why should we expect us to give up? That's a good point. It's a reciprocal relationship. And we want to be forgiven, and we want love, so we have to give it. To give it. Mm -hmm. It is. Matters, matters. Every human life. Now, part of the, and this is, I'll just end with uh, my side of it, uh, and share a little bit of my own theology. Part of what I appreciate most about the Eastern, the Persian view of the gates of hell being overgrown with flowers. Um, is that if there is something that is considered so evil and so outside of God's direction is Satan that at the end of time God won't even God's love won't even let that alone then that means in all my brokenness I can take comfort that God will reach out and bring me in as well that if God's gonna go so far in that direction that hopefully I'll be in that direction too when he comes and brings us all back into relationship. The same idea goes with, there's a, a side theology with Judas, that Judas did not what was evil, but what he thought was necessary. And the reason that he killed himself was out of remorse, because he loved Christ so much, he saw what went wrong out of his hands, like a, a snowball that went down the hill and he lost control and that it was out of love for that man that he inevitably condemned that he hanged himself in that remorse and that even then that person that Judas that we so vilify that maybe God can redeem that person at the end as well and if there can be redemption for that sinner then surely me and my brokenness and my continual sin that gives me hope that God won't give up on me as not give up on me either. But and like, the cock 
Baptist yes. make Judas a saint because had Christ not died, he could not have risen. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And the same goes for uh, Satan in the garden, in fact. The Jewish mystical side sees Satan as necessary because if Adam and Eve had remained exactly like they were, creation would not have continued. You wouldn't have babies. But after the temptation, all of a sudden they recognized each other's nakedness, and from that certain things could happen. So they say it. They see uh, Satan in that imbalance as a necessity for creation to continue. And if creation is an act of God, all of a sudden, just like Judas being necessary for Christ to have his sacrifice, Satan's temptation is what was necessary for creation to continue in its propagation here on earth as an act of God. It's a difficult theology, and it's obviously not one that you hear in the pulpit, but it's one that's long, long standing in the more contemplative mystical tradition, because at that point the duality, and I think this is where we'll leave it, to have good and evil is a duality. We know that in our hearts, God is non-dual, because God is outside of a good or an evil, because God is. Good, as Brother Addison was pointing out, is something we define for ourselves, and while someone may do something that we consider as evil, in their mind, it's perfectly good. So duality breaks down because of, or is necessitated because of perception. But if God, who is all perception, because he sees all is all, then that duality can't exist. And there is no definition of good or evil ultimately for God. And it's just a language we're trapped in. And if we keep trapped in it, then we simply lock in that dual nature of creation. But if we can escape for a moment, to have a God mind of the world around us, that uh, cloud of unknowing, that agnosis from pseudo Dionysius, that uh, messianic consciousness, that Christ consciousness. If we can have that moment of non duality, then we can see our relationship with others as a divine moment as opposed to an other or moment. And I think that's what we all strive for in our prayer, but because we're human, we always inevitably come back to one or the other. And that's the tension we live in. And I think that's why this can never have a solid answer for us. Right. right. So, Brother Kenneth, before we do Cromwell, um, yeah. I just want to remind you that next week, because it is St. Patrick's Day, yeah. uh, we are going to have a uh, Celtic house blessing. Yes. And um, I do know that all of you are on part of that. Um, and then the week after that is Holy Week. So right. I do know whether or not um, I'm part of the house blessing of the house blessing community uh, next week. Uh, Helen is going to be the house blessing. And she's bringing. Uh, uh, and Father John Price, Price. Mm -hmm. uh, who is an Episcopal uh, priest. And um, I just want to also let you know, Father John Price is the author of the book Revealing Heaven. He's a retired right, right. Episcopal right. priest. Right. And the group does right. not right. 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 become part of our group. Right. And he is also going to do house mass for us once a month. Wonderful. So we'll have a resident so we'll from the diocese. The diocese. The diocese. Yes. So he's not affiliated. He's affiliated with Palmer Church, but he's he's part of the So that means that he has a lot of responsibility. So the ability to come to Palmer and for us once a month here uh, was very appealing to him. Yeah, that's very gracious of him. Also, a very very to know. And. Um, right. So he is going to join Helen next week, and the two of them know each other. They've known each other for a long time, long time in community, community. And so uh, they're both going to be with us next Thursday to do the, the house blessing. It's fantastic. And we're going to yeah, do a little, we'll have a little bit, have a little bit of celebration with uh, uh, here in Ireland. Uh, 
for it. A soda bread. There we go. There we yeah. go. Um, may, you know, we've been a we've been a real prayer community here, as you know, and we've been yeah. uh, praying for a number of people that have asked us to pray for them, as you all do in Houston. Houston. I think I mentioned, I mentioned uh, a friend of mine, a friend of ours in Houston who happens to be a Hindu woman who right. has become friends of ours. Uh, and I think I told you about her sister, who two days or three days before she was lost, was in a freak accident and lost her right leg. Right. Uh, we have been praying on stop for her. And today, today, the lovely letter that you have also prayed for her over there. And I'd like to read it. It's very short. And um, what you just describes the darkness and light in the world. Um, that when we demonstrate it to others, it's very difficult for the for the powers of hell to try to destroy it. But let me read this. It's from our friend Darren. She writes, especially for my wonderful Thursday evening prayer group family and friends. A heartfelt thank you for all your prayer and prayer and thoughts for my sister and our family. Our prayers have been submitted because as of Friday, Friday of March, which is tomorrow, my sister will be returning to her home after being in the hospital for the past three months. Well. He underwent four surgeries in over two months of rehabilitation to deal with the reality that he lost her right foot to her right foot. During my short my short my sister, we cried, held each other, did physio exercises together, but truly the most meaningful conversations were around how such wonderful people, thousands of miles away, we're praying for her recovery. Despite the distance, you have touched her heart, and she understood how deeply our spiritual was. Words cannot describe the comfort and solace we felt as we felt your prayers and thoughts reverberating through our lives. I am personally so blessed that our lives have been saved. Though my sister will continue to have to get used to the fact that her life will be totally different, I see in her a result of how strong the best person can be. We also saw how devoted her during such a trying time. His patience and devotion to her has been God sent. God is kind and loving all the time. Thank you for your kindness and generosity, brothers and sisters. Looking forward to seeing you soon. Much love, Gianthi. That's wonderful. And so, so glad to hear she's finally going home. <laughs> yes. So she wanted you to convey her gratitude to all the brothers there in Atlanta, the community that have also prayed for her, prayed her sister. And I ask that you continue to pray for her as she goes home now, and the real struggle of being out in the world, having that challenge in front of her. Um, she has all the prayers, I'm sure, that we can offer her. Absolutely. So, well, thank you um, for sharing that. It's always good to hear how prayers are coming through. Yes. Well, I wanted to hear that, and especially with all the people that here, I know that I ask you all to pray for her Well, thank you. Okay. okay. Um, is there anything else on this end you'd like from us? No, I think uh, to be respectful of time, uh, let's offer Compline. Okay. Uh, if you'll mute your end, you can chant with us from ours. Uh, so everyone, Matthew, Craig, I see you out there as well. Uh, turning to page... Turn to page 127. 
let us attend. The Lord Almighty grant us a peaceful night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins to God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault in thought and word and deed and in what we have left undone for the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Forgive us all our offenses and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Psalm 31 In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Incline your ear to me. Make haste to deliver me. Be my strong rock, the castle to keep me safe. For you are my crag and my stronghold. For the sake of your name, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that they have secretly set for me. For you are my tower of strength. Into your hands I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith. Thanks be to God. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Keep us, O Lord, as the apple of your eye. Hide us under the shadow of your wings. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, hear our prayer. And let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Look down, O Lord, from your heavenly throne, and illumine this night with your celestial brightness, that by night as by day your people may glorify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night, and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary. Bless the dying. Soothe the suffering. Pity the afflicted, shield the joyous, and all for your love's sake. 
Amen. We pray to you, Lord, for all those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. Pray for Tracy, for Brother Francis, for Gianthi's sister, for David, for Sally's student. We pray to you, Lord, for those who are in need, for the homeless and hungry, for the poor, the destitute, the persecuted and imprisoned, for those suffering from famine, from war, and from natural disasters. We pray for those with particular needs, for Brother Francis at work, For Magenti, for Sarah, for Renee and her family, in your compassion, Lord, we pray to you for those who this night are dying. And in your mercy, we pray to you, Lord, for all those who have died. Receive them into your care. Let us offer our prayers for those who hold authority throughout the world, for the leaders of our nations and our communities. We pray for those who hold authority in our churches, for our patriarchs, our archbishops, and bishops, for Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, for Michael, our presiding bishop, for those bishops supporting our order, Rob and Keith of Atlanta, Andy, Dina, and Jeff of Texas, for Neil at Swanee, and Dorsey, our bishop visitor. And we pray for all priests, deacons, monastics, and laity, that together we may be the body of Christ on earth. We give thanks to you, Lord, for all the many blessings of this life, giving special thanks for Zeb's new job, I invite any other prayers, petitions, or thanksgivings, whether spoken or silent. For all our prayers, Lord, those spoken and unspoken, those which we bear in our hearts that are known truly to you alone, we ask these in Christ's most holy name. Amen. Amen. We continue together. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see, 
a light to enlighten the nations, and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and Merciful, Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us always. Amen. Go in peace, my brothers and sisters, to love and serve the Lord. And thanks be to God. We look forward to seeing you all next week for our house blessing in Houston, yes? Yes, yes. Make sure you wear your community. Absolutely. Okay, brother. I'll talk to you on the weekend. Good night, right. all. Bye bye. God's Bye. God's peace, Matthew. God's peace, Craig. God's peace. God's peace. We'll see you next week. See you next week. See you next week. I need to run.